you. Hello, everyone. It's been a while since we had our last climate talk, so it's a pleasure to be here and welcome you in another climate talk by the Puru Protocol. The role of retailers as drivers of climate action is the topic of our conversation today. But before we dig in, as usual, because there are new people tuning in for the first time, so let me introduce Portal Protocol to you. We are an international organization triggered by Taylor Sport, and we act as a wine community sharing knowledge, solutions, best practices, and challenges in the most practical fashion with the goal of bringing climate action to life. The scope of the work we do is only possible due to a growing network of companies that joined us from different sizes and different stages of climate action, which is really important, spread across the wine value chain and the world that enable us to gradually build a collaborative response from the wine industry to this crisis from soil to sip. And consider this an invitation to join us if you haven't yet, if you are a stakeholder within the wine industry, seeking to share and learn ways to tackle this emergency, we meet you where you are as we seek action and progress rather than perfection. And our experience for the last four years has shown us that this spirit of inclusiveness creates a wider space for learning and sharing. So I'm going to try to slow down as we are not able to solve this anymore still, uh, but moving to our climate talks, they are an absolute key tool for us of interaction between our members <clears throat> and between a wide community out there, because there are webinars in format, but they are really a space for our guests to share experiences, solutions, ideas, but challenges, but again, in the most practical fashion. So today, as we said, we're discussing the role of retailers uh, as drivers of climate action, and they are an absolute key stakeholder in the wine value chain. They can impact and even determine the entire value chain, supply chain, let's call it, from production to bottling choices, from logistics to transportation, and therefore the climate impact of wine. But ultimately, the most effective pressure from change is likely to come from consumers, which are being absolutely bombarded with climate change realities and calls to action way before reaching a supermarket shelf. This puts retailers in a unique position to educate and influence them in the so-called FMOT, the first moment of truth, which is that three to five seconds time span in which consumers take their ultimate purchasing decision. Let's not forget that we are all consumers and we are all retailers and we are all these organizations that actually ultimately take these decisions. So this virtual roundtable is about understanding how this retail industry is playing its role as part of the solution to mitigate our industry's climate impact, influencing consumers and producers alike. Before I introduce our guests today, let us acknowledge two things. One is that retail is a very wide concept. As, and as we'll explain, Scott is here too. I mean, he's, he, he shows how why the concept of retail is. And the second, um, the second factor that we have to acknowledge is that um, the industry, our wine industry, can learn from other industries as well. And the retail industry is an ex a perfect example of that. And again, Carmel is a perfect example of that as well, because she comes from, from an organization that leads not only with wine, although Carmel is focused not only in wine, actually, but in various other beverages, but also a myriad of other uh, fast-moving consumer goods. So, and before I introduce you to them, I'm going to wait one more second, one more minute to try to help my colleague here, Christina, in having Marcus join us before we can really start this chat. And again, please do not despair. I hope you have a, uh, a glass of wine just next to you. So we don't despair and hope we are able to solve this because we really want Marcus to join us. So let's see. Give us one more minute. Okay. Okay, Christina. Okay. Yes. Uh, the key. All right. Okay. Yeah. We're almost there. 
So bear with us. I need to log in into the email account. <laughs> no, Christina, we'll, we'll... Jesus. Um... Tina, Mark has sent his private email. Maybe we can try to register him. Okay. I'm doing that. Okay, I'm doing that. So what I'll do is, Marta, might you be able to dial in? Ah, that would be a good idea. And thank you for the suggestion. Uh, um, that was my backup. <laughs> uh, that could be a, yeah, that could be a solution. Actually, Christina, we didn't remember that. Yeah. But though he might. Uh, I don't know. Nevertheless. I will start this webinar. Yeah, yeah. I'll send him the information. Yeah. So I try to have him register. So everyone, I'm sorry for to keep you waiting. I will start by introducing Scott and Carmel. Carmel is joy is the head of sustain the sorry, not the head of sustainability. Bear with me if I'm a bit confused. Uh, Carmel is the head of technology for okay, let me get this right. Wine spirits beverages, soft uh, drinks and juices, if I'm not wrong, at Marks and Spencer, but she's also a master of wine. And in fact, she's been working with wine for many, many years, for various decades, in fact. And she's joining us, as I said, for Marks and Spencer, which is a huge uh, British ma uh, major retailer, and I'm sure you're all acquainted with it. Scott Case, again, he's been talking not so much about wine, but about sustainability and climate change for various decades. And he's joining us from the US, from Philadelphia, if I'm not wrong. And he's the VP for Corporate Social Responsibility and Sustainability at the uh, American National Retail Federation. That is actually the world largest uh, retail um, association in the world, if I'm not wrong, correct? Okay, and I'll introduce you to Marcus in a second, but most of you know Marcus as well. Marcus is the, uh, the sustainability manager for System Belaget, the state-owned monopoly from Sweden that um, that is the only is the only uh, organization actually that is He's here. Is here. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. I was just introducing Marcus. So let's just, everyone, I'm, we apologize. These things happen and sometimes we're able to solve it, sometimes we're not. Uh, sorry about this. Marcus. Woof. <laughs> Thank welcome. You. Welcome. Thank you. And sorry about this. <laughs> no, this it, happens. it happens. It happens sometimes. Again, everyone, we're here, and I was just about to introduce you. You're just the last one, so I was saying, as I said, Marcus is a sustain sustainability manager for System Balaget. He's also been working with sustainability for a long time, and System Balaget, as I was saying, is the only organization state-owned uh, that is uh, able to, to sell alcohol beverages in Sweden. So without further ado, because I think we have waited enough, let me ask um, all of you, and I'll start, for example, with Scott, because the fact is we have here an organization, System Belaget, that is that works mainly on wines. We have a retailer that works with various uh, consumer goods, and then we have Scott that really represents a wider organization. So let me ask you overall, how is climate change and its associated risks being understood and integrated in the retail business strategy regionally and globally. So let's start with the US, Scott, the word is yours. Hey, wonderful, thank you, Marta. And thank you for the invitation to be here. This is, this is an incredibly impressive panel and I am busy ready to take notes because the wine industry is not my area of focus, 
um, other than you know what I know about it from the from the glass. Um, so uh, the National Retail Federation, we are the world's largest trade association for retailers. Um, I joined in January of 21 with a focus on sustainability and corporate social responsibility. From a retail industry perspective, retailers understand that in many ways, we're kind of the, the center of the universe, right? We are the intersection between supply chains and consumers. So it's at the retail store shelf or the, reset, the retail website or the retail app, however you choose to buy. Um, that's the point where consumers get the opportunity to kind of learn about the, uh, the sustainability impacts of their purchases. What retailers like Marks and Spencer and others are doing is they are making very specific sustainability commitments, frequently focusing on climate change and ways to drastically reduce retail contributions to climate change. And where do those contributions come from? It turns out it's not really the stores that are the most significant factor. It turns out that 98% of the climate related impacts from the retail industry are supply chains. And what we're gonna do today is talk about the wine supply chain, but remember retail is more than just wine. Um, retailers and the NRF and others, they're selling electronics, they're selling appliances, they're selling fashion, they're selling personal care products and makeup and wine and food. And there are so many different aspects to it. And every one of those retail verticals has drastically different sustainability impacts and sustainability stories. And so that makes it very challenging for retailers to tell a sustainability story to consumers, because what we would say about sustainable wines and the climate impacts of wine is going to be different than if we were talking about a major appliance or maybe talking about furniture. And so part of the challenge is retailers are still learning to tell effective stories to consumers so that consumers can make better choices. The last thing I would just kind of point out too, um, and Carmel, I'm hoping you can shed some insights on this, um, but the buyers inside of the retail industry, right? The buyers who decide which products are gonna be on the website or on a store shelf, in many retail companies, they change roles several times. You might be the retailer that's in charge of which potato chips are on a store shelf one week. And then the next, you know, your job changes and all of a sudden you're in charge of furniture or you're in charge of appliances. And so those buyers have a hard time learning all the sustainability information because they might shift from one product category to a different product category, and they have to start their lessons all over again. So these are just some of the challenges that the retail industry is facing. But luckily, the wine supply chains have figured it out. Right, Marcus? Right, Carmel? Carmel, have they? <laughs> yeah. Shall I pick up from some of those questions? Yes, yes, yes. yes well, yes. I think, um, Scott, a lot of uh, my observations are very similar to yours. Um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, my figures tally very close to yours, that for m and it was estimated that 3% are scope one, and the 97% are scope two and three. And a, for a company like m and that has had a history of a very strong sustainability stance, and um, they're uh, totally committed to the net zero target by uh, 2040. But there's some quite bullish figures in before that. Um, we're hoping to reduce by a third our footprint by 2025, because who knows who's going to be retired by 2040, and by a half by 2030. So um, one of the big pieces occurring within M&S, and just sort of for scale on M&S, it's, um, it's a big retailer that has interest in clothing and home, as well as food and wine. Um, but in terms of wine, we would sell, I checked today, about 55 million units or 300 uh, million turnover. So we're a big player in um, own brand um, on wine. Um, but one of the key aspects is that there are areas within the food uh, primary agriculture that probably 
will be bigger hitters when we can improve and produce them in a low carbon way. So in a roundabout way, what the, the focus may not be on wine from a, a, a corporate um, perspective, but within the wine category, it is very much on our agenda. And it's interesting what you say about um, buyers moving around. Wine is probably the one area where we do have consistency because it takes a lot, a good bit of time to learn the topic. People like the category. So we do have people that stay in the category for a certain amount of time. So that does help with continuity. But within MS, the sustainability agenda does sit with, well, it sits with everybody, but the technical and technology team do run with that. And so we, um, by our nature, are very evidence based. So within our team, we have uh, formulated a strategy for how do we impact and reduce the climate uh, footprint of our products. And I think one of the interesting things about wine is, is it's a discretionary purchase. Firstly, you know, you don't need it to live, but you might need it to live happily. And also a lot of consumers are very wedded to the packaging format that it's in, which is glass for 90% of product. So some of the work that needs to be done on that once we do our analysis has to be done behind the scenes. And that I think is where the retailers really need to take on that responsibility. So our plans, some of our plans may be overt where we um, ensure that we uh, present products and uh, wines to consumers in um, a range of formats if, um, if you know, we want to reduce uh, some of the CO2 outputs and some of the packaging but also in terms of how we range in terms of locally sourced products, et cetera. So a lot of the work that we've been doing in the last year has been focusing on where, where are they, the big CO2 contributors and what are the issues that consumers have problems with? So for instance, plastic, there is a lot of emotion with consumers on plastic. So while on one level that could have a very good carbon footprint, um, unless that is a totally closed loop and the risk of pollution is removed, that is not necessarily a packaging choice that consumers in wine want to take readily. Um, there has been progress on that as well, because that's one of the things that we've been really keen is to close the loop on that. But we have a multi-pronged uh, approach to how we're going to move forward on our uh, carbon footprint on wine. And we plan to roll that out to our suppliers in the autumn. So I'll be able to share some hot news hopefully today, but um, we have looked at what are, the, what are the levers that we can impact? What are the decisions that we can take as buyers? And how do we take consumers on that journey where it is appropriate? You touched on very po uh, various points that we will definitely want to explore. Namely, as you put it, uh, Scott, how do we tell the stories to consumer? And I think Marcus, not just yet, but I think Marcus might be able, especially in terms of wine, I think you might have experience on that end. Use the expression behind the scenes. And I think that's one of the topics, topics we should try to use today, not necessarily in the context that you use, but when we think of the waste stream, for example, which is one of the impacts of wine that is not visible to consumers and really touches the supply chain and the relationship between uh, the retailer, yourselves, and uh, the producer. And also I think it's worth exploring here uh, and I'm sh I imagine, uh, my intuition tells me that Carmel and Marcus have completely different consumer approaches on how plastic and glass is perceived, because I imagine that a good percent, many wines you have in your shelves with very good reception from the consumer are from plastic. But let's, okay, just, I just wanted to grab these points, but let's start with more general stuff before going to this detail. And let me just say something else. You mentioned locally sourced, and the fact is, and well, whether we like it or not, climate change really built uh, wine industry in the in the UK, didn't it, uh, Carmel? Which, uh, which, if you talk about local resource, maybe you open a, a window there for more wines coming from the the UK markets. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And um, I didn't think that I am, um, you know, if you'd asked me five years ago, is this what we would be looking at? But we're hoping to, to double our offering in the next year. Yes. So, okay. um, so that's an exciting development, but it's still quite a small subset. So we do want to have yeah. a global offering. And it is a case of how do we have that as magical as possible for consumers? Okay. All right, Marcus, an overall view, how do you think the retail um, 
market, um, retail, well, retailers as a whole, as an industry is perceiving this before we go into the detail of your own organizations? Yeah, just thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. Thank, thank, thank you and you. sorry for this. But <laughs> happens. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry too that I have some struggle to... to no, um... we all did. We all struggled. We okay. all struggled. Not oh, just... that's, that, that's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I'm uh, working at Sustainbolog uh, uh, with the sustainability issues uh, and uh, Sustainbolog, for those of you who don't know, uh, we are the Swedish monopoly retailer of alcoholic beverages in Sweden and the mission is to, main mission is to, to uh, limit the negative consequences of alcohol consumption. Uh, but being a monopoly, I would say that it, what comes with that is a high degree of responsibility in terms of sustainability overall. So I would say that we have, back in history, we, the focus on sustainability issues has been quite high for quite many years. And, and the focus, I would say that 12, 15 years ago, we started to focus on packaging because we realized uh, building on on current LCA at that time, that uh, the the packaging was the main single spot that you could work on to really really limit the, the climate impact of, of the total product. And I, I won't say that it's easy, but it's a very single uh, uh, emission uh, aspect that you could really work with, and you can do a lot of things and, and gain a lot of reduction uh, compared to other uh, emission spots in the in the supply chain upstream uh, I, I would say that it's very it's very isolated aspect the packaging so it's very we're still working on it of course because we have a long way to go <laughs> so we, we we did some at the company level we did some lcas at 2010 quite extensive LCAs just to map the different kind of materials and what they correlate the to in terms of impact on, on the environment and climate. And we have done some uh, re-evaluation of those LCAs uh, recently, uh, 2018 and 2019, just to, to update the figures. So, so this was kind of one of the main focus that we had very much related to climate but uh, I would say that today we are doing a lot of things that is not only on the packaging because as as we all know we are not in line with the Paris Agreement as as as, um, as communities and countries and if you if you uh, I mean if you look on the company level we need to to I mean to to be at the the this the track on on the on the way to one and a half degree maximum and, and i think there's a responsibility that we all have and we have recently decided that at the leadership of system log it had decided to to agree on a 50 percent reduction of the total uh, climate uh, climate emissions in the in the full supply chain uh until 2030 and uh, not only that we had also an ambition to uh, to have a uh, commitment to the size-based targets uh, initiative, uh, which means that we we do have to uh, to measure and follow up uh, on the way to 2030 if we are having the the, the right pace, so to say. <laughs> So that's, uh, I think this, it's a big difference. If you only have, only, I, I say, <laughs> if you only have a target to, to reduce your emissions by 50%, and if you add to that, that you should commit to, to science-based targets, that, that's a big difference, I would say, because it's really, it's really something that uh, builds credibility uh, among your targets. So that's where we are today. So we are right in between, uh, two strategic periods uh, that one goes to 2023 and the other one will, will start after that and go to 2025. Uh, so uh, so uh, we are kind of, this will be uh, make a high, uh, high footprint on all strategic and 
and practical uh, work at Systembolaget having impacts in the full supply chain, what we should do. Because uh, as you said, Carmel, uh, the, we, I, I think uh, we have some different figures, but I think between 95 and 98% of the total climate impact uh, refers to scope three. So that's the real challenge. I mean, how to how to to improve and strengthen our sphere of influence on on the uh, farmer level and the producer level. That's a real that's that's a real challenge. I would say. I talk too much, so you should interrupt me. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, thinking about uh, yeah, one important thing: feel free to interrupt each other and talk to each other because that's how this uh, enriches the conversation. So, Marcus, if I got you right, you not only set a target for 2030 to be compliant with the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 uh, degrees, yeah. also with the science-based targets. Um, so you have these two big targets. If I'm not wrong, I, I believe I read and you said that you had another target for 2025, but you yeah. also have something to 2023, don't you? Yeah, Actually, you're do. answering my next question was about your organization specific goals. So you might as well answer yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 2023 targets are uh, related to both our own impact in at Sustainable Logit, which is kind of the head office and a little bit more than 500 stores and it's very much about energy use and uh, and also cooling agents and uh, and some some uh, some uh, some of the transports related okay. to personnel so they're more related to your own operation that is yeah, to exactly. mostly they're not so much uh, directed to scope 3 for example which is at the end of the day the one that affects supply yeah. Well, yeah, affects we do. suppliers and affects you yeah we do we do have some some objectives and targets related to scope 3 uh, okay. for 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 the next year uh, that should be uh, complied and fulfilled and that is but those are more like visionary goals uh, and that's okay. the challenge that we see today, that we we do a lot of things to reach those goals, but at the same time, we have we have sub targets, uh, which is more related to KPIs that we can measure. Yes. So that the objectives that you have read in, in our uh, responsibility uh, report, yes. Yeah, yeah, they are more qualitative uh, yeah. expressed. Yes. So, so it's more widened to guide you. Uh, so the challenge now is to to build KPIs that we could really measure and compare to in, in different. Uh, and those KPIs well. would be for you as well as to your suppliers and to other uh, to your network of suppliers in general. Yeah, also the suppliers because, I mean, if you commit to science-based target, you can you cannot do what we have done so far is to do uh, life cycle analysis. Uh, which most of the companies do today is to build on generic data. So you you you, you collect default data. What is what is uh, the footprint of a uh, bottle of red wine from Italy? And you have those figures. You can can just pick them from different databases. But that I would say that that is not enough if you should comply with the science-based target because you you need to be able to track your, your improvements in the field. And the default data and the generic data that you have access to will not be, uh, be that, I would say, uh, sensitive enough to follow those improvements. So you need to put in, in your life cycle analysis, you should, of course, you still need generic data because you can't have your own data on everything, but you need to feed in site-specific data. And that means that we need, in practice, we need to collect data from the farmers and the producers in terms of related to different, uh, I mean, emission aspects that they have, like use of fertilizers, use of, of fuels, different kind of fuels and the electricity and the local, uh, the local, uh, impact uh, that this electricity has for each and every region. So you can imagine this is a real challenge, but we, we need to it's take a huge that challenge. Yes, yeah, it's a yeah. huge challenge indeed. And I'm sure yeah. 
in producers on our audience. I, they know that it's a big challenge. I will not. I, will, I I got some notes here. One is that you really widen the conversation, not the conversation, but the 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 scope of what you're looking into from just looking into packaging to really looking to the overall supply yeah. chain. But let me just ask Scott and then Carmel, because uh, I know Carmel has really hot has news for us, and that's very good. But Scott, I know of course you can't talk of your organization because you have thousands of them, but do you see this this uh, this path that um, this path and this consciousness that Marcus is sharing with us? You no, know, uh, understanding the 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 need to uh, to cope with uh, the Paris Agreement and also the need to go for science based targets to to really set targets. Do you see that? Okay, of course you can't talk about the wine industry, but you have really huge players that have wine as well. Do you see this happening in your in your universe? Uh, ab absolutely. In, in fact, um, NRF released a report uh, January of this year uh, called Retailers Reaching for Net Zero. And what we were doing is just documenting what mostly US-based retailers, right? Because everyone assumes Europe's gotten it, doing it a little bit better or a little bit faster. This was really a focus on some of the US-based retailers uh, and they are, in fact, to Marcus's point, they are making science-based targets and the associated commitments, and they are committing to regularly reporting on progress towards these goals. Uh, so that is happening. I think one of the big challenges that retailers, and I think this is a global challenge, retailers are struggling with how to bring consumers along in that conversation. Um, so what's wonderful about wine, right, Consumers, there's that, that taste, right? They, they, it's all about the taste ultimately. But wine has a beautiful story about the provenance. Where did these grapes come from? What soil conditions? What year? And, and that's a wonderful access point to telling a sustainability story that might be an advantage in the wine industry that doesn't necessarily exist in furniture or electronics. And so when wine does this very, very well, you're teaching the rest of these retail verticals how to tell stories. So some of the lessons from this industry will apply to other industries. But I don't want to stop because Carmel apparently has news. So I'm oh. going to turn it <laughs> to you. Oh, I regret having said that. Well, no, actually, I mean, I think um, I think you make a really valid point about how do you take the story to consumers. And um, I remember talking to one of our insights team about um, you know how important is the is sustainability when somebody's in the wine aisle when they're in me and my pleasure mode rather than me and my virtuous hat mode and um i think a really good insight when we talked about it is it is not necessarily the primary driver it will be for a certain percentage of the market but it might be like single digit that specifically have that as their number one aspect but it is a great support so an example that i would use is um, in sort of pouch, wine and pouch. So rather than say this is 70% less in CO2, the message that resonates with consumer is, you know, how convenient this is. It makes it really easy if you're out on a picnic, it's great for sharing. And guess what? There's a good story behind that. And that lands so much better with consumers than something a bit more overt. So occasionality is really important. And selling in multiple aspects. And another example that I could give is um, for PET. So at the moment, we sell a lot of small formats in PET. It's very easy, nice for picnics. Consumers barely notice it, but it is recyclable and it has a good uh, carbon footprint. And um, about seven or eight years ago, we went with a 75 CL PET bottle with a major line and it didn't do well at all. So consumers were not necessarily ready for that. And perhaps we kind of put it out there and maybe didn't support it as much. So what we have to be really cognizant is consumers do move on. So the, the worry about plastic may not be always a problem if consumers can see and customers that you have a closed loop uh, solution. So for instance, in the last year, we now take back soft plastics. So that fear about, is this gonna end up in a river? can be removed. So there's items like that, that it means that we've got, we're freer to bring in different formats. 
and to see when consumers are ready to try different things. And then on um, the obvious thing behind the scenes is moving wine in bulk. So moving filled product in glass, you really have to have a very strong reason to do that these days. So we've got a very active program. Now consumers don't and customers don't see that side, but I think as a re we have a responsibility to take that to the max where we can. So that's another big item, that a big ticket item. And then on light weighting, you know, putting the message out there, we've lightened your bottle to lighten the load on the climate. We think consumers might be a lot more ready for that, inf that information. And while it's always been quite easy at entry level, it does feel like we're ready to get a little bit brave. I mean, I had a conversation with somebody like Barolo being a 360 gram bottle and it was, oh, oh my God, I don't know if we could do that. But, you know, we can set targets to our uh, suppliers to say, in this price point, we think you can be here. We think that the supply is available for that type of line. So we've got that program going. And um, I suppose the other aspect is, there's a lot of other stories to do with sustainability that I think can really um, help consumers get engaged about wine and um, partly inspired by Porto Protocol's uh, workshops earlier on this year, we did a very detailed questionnaire to our suppliers and I thought, I'm not sure if we're gonna get a response. And we got a fantastic and interesting response. Um, we gave our suppliers, you know, about a month and some people had a lot of work to do, but it actually was very uplifting to see the level of work going on at grassroots. So I think with, digital options now we need to get some of those stories out to consumers and to customers so they can feel really good about their their purchases and open that door to maybe address some of the last bastions that they have which is you know my wine has to be in a heavy bottle and the heavier it is the better it is so that's kind of the last thing that we have to have to uh, move on and um yeah so there are sort of the key items that i think we need to move on but we can't assume that it's just an intellectual aspect in terms of when consumers pick up a bottle of wine. So if we're going to change that, we need to take consumers with it. So it's not by stealth. We should be overt as to why we are changing packaging if we're doing that. So that's what we're looking at for the next year. But how do we take that message? Journalists are there completely and wine journalists. Every time we have a, a meeting, they will ask about sustainability. So we just need to move that dial. And that's why I think I love visiting the Nordic markets. I think They've always been inspiring and it's really interesting to see. I know a monopoly does change things slightly because if you want your bottle of wine, you're going to listen to your messages. But it is really interesting as to how far consumers can go. And I remember that was the first place that I saw. I think it was Chablis in Bag and Box. And it really made me think, what can the world become if, you know, if 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 things are positioned in the right way? So to, to be a bit like a BBC uh, documentary, we are on a journey, we genuinely are. So it is moving with our suppliers and also moving at the pace with customers and just nudging that conversation a little bit. Since we're talking about consumers and I cannot contradict the flow of the talk, we'll go back to guidelines and to purchasing decisions. Mark Harmel, just picking up where you where you left off, taking consumers, what? how are you telling how are you starting to tell those stories to consumers? Is it in the point of sales? Because I know Marcus has good examples on that. Is it through your website? Is it on social media? How do you feel you have a role as an educator? And are you fulfilling it? I think we, we do that usually via our journalists. And um, when I say, oh, are the UK journalists, that they can very much be our voice in the market. So when we... Um, when we show our products and we have press tastings regularly throughout the year, we will highlight um, work that we are doing in this space. And they are very much sort of an, ind an independent arbiter for us. So like we are increasing our organic offering as well and our locally sourced. So they are very much up for that conversation and they do act as champions on that. Um, I think we're entering into another area where we can be a little bit braver because of the capacity of digital communication. So via a QR code, I think that's the space that we would like to be able to show where we, where suppliers are doing some great work. So if suppliers have got certain accreditations, we can already share that if we, you know, if that's the direction of travel, but we have the capacity to reveal a lot more of the backstory. And that's an incentive, I think, to producers, if retailers can get to that point to say, okay, how do we 
open up the door and show and you know showcase suppliers that are really um, and producers that are really taking this on. So I think that that's where we would like to work through. I suppose the other item that I have mentioned is environmental management systems. And while that is a little bit behind the scenes, we place a lot of uh, credence in encouraging our suppliers to do that because that has such a wide reach across all aspects of sustainability, like waste management, and um, energy usage. I mean, there was, that was probably the most exciting bit was, you know, how many people are basically turning to solar, which makes a lot of sense in wine growing areas. But that whole piece um, about the entire chain of custody on sustainability. So over half of our suppliers are already on what we would call sort of flagship environmental management systems. So we are targeting them to increase that number. And by 2025, we want all of our suppliers to be signed up so that the whole picture is being covered rather than just one dimension of it, you know. So um, multi-pronged approach, that's what you've got to do. Yes, you ended up touching various points there. The one that will affect your suppliers and also are you having that conversation with consumers? Marcus, am I right to say that the way you, you talk to your consumers, so to speak, is more on, on the, in the point of sales? Would you well, in the point of sales in, in your website, uh, I, I've seen it in, in yeah. various uh, ways. Yeah, yeah. But before that, I would like to, I'm happy to hear that Carmel uh, is mentioning this uh, uh, management system, uh, environmental management system, because we have one year back we have introduced in our purchase uh, requirements on the suppliers because it, it, it's the suppliers uh, that we have the the commercial agreement with uh, and they need to have a management system in place to 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 uh, work with environmental impacts and uh, and it's I, I would call it the iso 14001 light version so to say so they need to have a proact proactive, uh, systematic approach to their environmental impact, their own environmental impact. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that, Carmel. And, and uh, in addition to that, in the purchase agreement, we also have some requirements that the, the supplier should have an active dialogue with the producers and the farmers about some specific issues that we have uh, defined and found that there is a consensus in the wine business, uh, things that are really relevant in terms of environment and climate related to production and, uh, I mean, to the winery and to the grape growing uh, stage. So, um, yeah. Uh, regarding the consumers, we have, if we go back uh, during, uh, I would say, 10 years, we have been working with a concept that is a combination of what we call climate smart packaging. So in the shops, we are uh, addressing those products that have um, uh, climate smart packaging. So uh, very, very, to simplify that, we are avoiding uh, the heavy glass bottles in, in that sense. And uh, in addition to that, we have ethic, eth ethical choice. That is uh, the, the base for that is fair trade and fair for life. And uh, we also have the organic uh, products that are has been uh, highlighted uh, at the shelter in, in the stores. But what we did this, uh, this spring at the beginning of March was that we launched a totally new system to guide the customers because we think it was a time to, uh, to update the concept of sustainability to more, uh, you know, I mean, to meet the needs and expectations of the customers. So we have done some research uh, among the customers, what they, what, I mean, what they need and what they expect in our shops in terms of sustainability related to the products. And, and uh, it's very obvious that they are, the interest among the Swedish customers is quite high in terms of sustainability, but they want it to be simple should be a very simple choice, not too complicated, because they have limited of time that they, they spend in our shops. Quite often they know exactly what kind of product they want and they take it and they go out. So, so we have really a limited time to, to guide them. So it, it should be kind of traffic light system. We did not end up with a traffic light system. Uh, I would say uh, we ended up with a green light 
system. So Nobody wants are, to be red <laughs> and the yeah, traffic lights. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't use the red light in, in the shop. <laughs> so so uh, so we are uh, we are uh, highlighting those products that we call sustainable choice. And what does sustainable choice mean today in this concept? It means that it covers the environmental aspects, climate aspects, but in addition to that, of course, also labor conditions and human rights. And, and, uh, and the third part is the packaging. So if you want your product to qualify, you need to have in place, uh, the performance on your product should be uh, good uh on uh, on in terms of environmental performance climate and and labor conditions so we have different kind of systems to analyze if the product is is uh, qualifying for that uh, and we had done lots of uh, work to map all the different sustainability certification that are relevant in in the business so there are more than 40 uh, certification system. So we have mapped them in terms of 17 different indicators so that we know that each and every certificate means different things in terms of human rights specific issues like child labor, working hours, uh, etc. Um, and also some, some issues on, on the environmental part like soil health, biodiversity, climate and energy, etc. So, and we can, those certifications that are good enough, so to say, covering uh, most of the important issues, qualify for this concept. And we, we have another system to do a risk analysis of each and every product, depending on where it comes from, from the origin. Because we, we buy land risk data and we combine that with different kinds of certifications. So if you are, in a country with some specific uh, rights, uh, some specific risks related to, uh, to human rights and labor conditions, you should have a certificate that is kind of mitigating those specific risks. Then the product is uh, clean or, or green. And uh, so, so this is, uh, it's a quite, what I'm going to, my point is that it's a very complicated system backstage, but, what we communicate to the customers is very simple. It's, this is sustainable choice. It means that there are, we have gone through the risks in terms of labor conditions and, and it, it has good performance in terms of environmental aspects and climate. And it has a, a packaging that is uh, have limited uh, impact on climate also. So, so that Marcus, is kind can of- can I ask problem. on that, do you, is it your, Obviously, it's your target to have 100% of your products with that, or do you have it sort of like flagship products that are score extremely well on all of those metrics, or is there any grading in that, or is it there's, a certain percentage has that? Yeah, that's a very very good question. Uh, there's no grading in the concept. You either you have a product that is sustainable choice, or you don't have sustainable choice. So it's quite a kind of. Uh, uh, digital, uh, but we we don't expect 100% of the assortment to qualify for sustainable choice because that will undermine the credibility of, of the system. It should be uh, some share of the assortment that is better than the rest of it. So we are Carl, working I love your, your question um, and kind of a related question. Marcus, it sounds like the Swedish customer is responding slightly different than, than customers in other parts of the world. If I understood Carmel correctly, m and is leading with immediate consumer benefits. This is easier to take on a picnic. This is more convenient at home. Um, and those are kind of immediate consumer benefits. Is the Swedish customer that much different that you can lead with sustainability? No, I, I don't think they are so different to that, but maybe, uh, I mean, learning from the research that we have done is that the, the, I mean, sustainability is really on the agenda for, for quite many people. And, uh, but, but there, is a, there is a difference. If you, if you say that you really uh, care about the nature or sustainability or climate, 
And if you really make a difference when you buy a product. And, uh, so, so maybe I should qualify, Scott, on that. Um, it is specifically in wine that that observation was made. So I saw some pretty interesting research about consumers' concerns on packaging. And um, as Marsh said at the beginning, I, I love wine, I cover wine, but I also cover all the beers, wines and spirits, soft drinks and juices. So I have quite a number of products in plastic. And plastic was the number one concern with consumers and pollution. So 66% of consumers said that they were worried about it, actively felt bad about it. Whereas wine in glass was quite low on their radar as a concerning form of package. Now we know in the background, um, there are some uh, heavy glass is not really the direction of travel that we really want to be in. So there is that balance with consumers. It's not that they're not necessarily engaged, but they don't see it as a problem when they have curbside collection and they see on TV that glass can be recycled. So it feels like an infinitely rewarding form of packaging. So I think we have to do the work on finding lower, um, lower emission glass production. And that's like really interesting projects going on in that in the next three to five years, hope to have something exciting on that. And um, just to sort of push that envelope of if we are in PET or um, that closed loop systems just have to be developed and we can't really wait for the infrastructure in your country to, to move with that. Sometimes you just have to grab that. And, you know, other retailers in the UK are also doing that to give credit to that. So, um, um, and interestingly, Marcus, in terms of, um, as a scientist, I totally agree with the principle about the importance of measurement and um, consistent systems. But I have found myself sometimes feeling that, you know, in terms of the climate uh, change agenda, that it's a bit like you go to the doctor and they tell you that you've got a heart condition and I go back to my house and I see a pork pie and a cream cake there and I see the sofa. That even before we do all of the measurement for all of our suppliers, we say, well, we know the changes that will make a difference. So I find that the, the overall information out there really tells you that some things you have to do. You should, if you're in glass, you need to lightweight, you need to lightweight fast and you need to do, do it ambitiously bulk transport, you need to do work on that. You need to really encourage your suppliers and incentivize the suppliers who do it to get on with their agenda, you know, electric vehicles, clean up that energy as much as they can. And, you know, to bring that into the commercial discussions and then lo sourcing locally and taking the stories to consumers and feeling brave about that. You don't have to be perfect, but you need to be improving and you need to be taking it seriously. So there will be a stage where there are, I think, as, um, accepted standards to, to work to, but we, we can't stop and not do stuff because we haven't decided on what's the perfect tool. You know, I need to get rid of the pork pies. I need to not sit on my sofa. I need to take the exercises that we can do because that's really like doing the right thing and changing the numbers in terms of uh, what we're, we have on shelf. Do you think as an organization, so you know exactly what you have to do with your suppliers? So do you think, and in a way you said it, there's more to come with that environmental system that you're putting in place. So they can expect um, more strict measures to come in the in the future, in a way, Carmel. Exactly, so um, as I said, over half of our suppliers are already signed up to what we would regard as some of the leading um, standards. And it is important to allow a little bit of flexibility about local, environmental management systems because you know the issues that the, the challenges for instance in Australia with salinity could be different than you know the challenges in South America so we said like let's keep it open but we do want suppliers to be accredited and give people time and just make it clear that that's that's our direction of travel so if you want to continue dealing with M&S this is what we're working towards and um, you know we really we want to support our, our suppliers through that journey as well and um, but that's you sometimes have to set those targets and the same with light weighting it's a tough year to be being extremely strict about glass sourcing because of global challenge so we are allowing some flex but the direction of travel has to be really clear and you know and we, we speak regularly with our buyers you know because the techs are very much over this in our organization um, and our buyers are aligned with that and so once it starts coming into commercial considerations that's where you really begin to to get traction and we have to make it work with consumers as well, because you know this is what we need to do to hit our company targets as well and our um, commitments, yeah. our stakeholder commitments um, on that as well. 
So um, that forces you to be a pathfinder. Yeah. yeah, you yes. If you have those commitments, you really have to comply with them at the end of the day. Scott, do you see from the consumer's part, and I think we've seen here two types of consumers, let's say, speaking on, on behalf of the, the American audience, so to speak, do you see this concern in, in American, um, American consumers? Is there this concern of actually looking, being worried about climate, but then actually manifesting their, their concern in the point of sales when they purchase? It, the consumers, and I think this is true all over the world, consumers are all over the map. And, and the challenge is there's an interesting learning curve and consumers come to these kinds of sustainability um, conversations from different, very different places. So if a consumer is convinced that plastic is the biggest evil in the world and they want to get rid of plastic, they tend to not be open to a conversation around, hey, sometimes packaging and plastic reduces overall carbon footprint. And so as a retailer, you can't tell them they're wrong um, they'll just go somewhere else. So there's there's this weird process of 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 retailers and consumers learning together. And the problem is you've got all those different types of consumers all shopping in the same aisle or the same website at the same time. And so finding ways to have conversations that are meaningful with different types of consumers who have different levels of understanding and different personal preferences becomes very, very challenging, which is why, I shout out to uh, Porter Protocol, I love it when there's an entire industry that's kind of moving everyone in the same direction, working up and down that value chain, working with the retailers and educating consumers, because I think that's where you start changing the norms so that when consumers are making decisions, they don't feel like they're making trade-offs. It's just like, this is where I'm going to get the best tasting wine, or this is where I'm going to get the most sustainable wine, and they're buying the exact same bottle. Exactly. And having that variety of products there, I mean, if, um, if low-carbon packaging was going to take off, wine that we have in pouch would be outselling everything, and it's not. But however, it does have a niche, and it's growing. So some of it is about making sure that the messaging is as useful as possible for consumers, because I agree, you have to listen to consumers rather than tell them stuff. I've learned that one a while back. So it is putting those products out there and staying close. Sometimes a concept, the, the market might not be ready sometimes for a concept, but you can revisit and you can re, um, reimagine that with consumers. And when you get closed, uh, I know I'm coming back to it, but the, sort of the closed loop um, management of packaging that can be problematic like um, plastic, that can be a game changer. That lifts it up for that we have removed the problem that was in your mind on this. And then that opens it up. And the other thing we're seeing like with the younger generation as well for single use, wine and can is taking off. So there's, there is movement in there and we just need to make sure we stay with consumers and we move fast enough. So that is the thing that where we probably have to dial up some of the communication and see what's um, what's happening in other markets. And journalists, I would say, have been really supportive of that. I mean, I actually enjoy the questions now, and I enjoy the pressure when they ask, "What are you doing?" Um, so that you know, the, the more that they write about that and sort of put that out there, that there's um, there's different ways of viewing packaging. And um, I think that that's really good. Let's not just well, if we just talk about packaging, our conversations always end up in packaging. I I, I wonder why, but anyway. Uh, let me ask you one thing, and, and I, I kindly ask you, because we don't have that much time, to look at Q&A, because there are a few questions there, and one of them is about water, and I know, Carmel, your thesis was on water a few decades ago, but it's absolutely key in the issue, but let me ask you, and Marcus already answered that question in, in one way, do you collect data, Carmel, from consumers, and and even Scott, in the US, do you, have, do you collect data to understand uh, this shift in consumers, uh, in we have, um, yes, we, we would have teams that would, um, we've got, uh, marketing colleagues that, um, that track that very closely. So, uh, for sure. And, and that does, you know, that it's really important to understand where consumers minds are, as I said, to see, um, to see a graph where, uh, 
one of the problem categories in consumers' minds is drinks in plastic versus wine in glass not being a problem is something we kind of need to understand it if that's where consumers' minds are. You've got to um, you've got to sort of move carefully in how you do that and how can you improve that. So um, recycle is really important. Uh, higher percentages of recycled material. All of those items and those initiatives are um, are moving along on that. Um, but as I said, in the UK, plastic is still the number one concern with consumers and they think about pollution. So I, the CO2, uh, CO2 emissions on plastic and transport is probably less at the forefront of people's minds than I have seen in other markets that I've um, dealt with in the past. But I think it's coming. And, and there's Michael. tons of data. There's so much data, it's actually problematic. And yeah. part of the problem is some of the people that are doing the surveys are very early in their own learning curve. And so okay. they ask okay. completely useless questions like, would you buy sustainable wine? Without defining what that means. And so the results are, are not particularly helpful to, to retailers or journalists or consumers trying to understand this stuff. And one of the Oh, sorry, just one other quick question. It'd be great, good to get the panel's view, but the most common question I, I'm asked is, what's the most sustainable type of packaging or what's the, be what's the best? Hmm. It's a big question. It depends where you are. It depends yeah, on yeah, what yeah. aspect you're looking at. Um, it's almost what's the best offering? What's the best portfolio and how do you improve hmm. it? That's how I fudge that one. <laughs> Marcus, I believe you've answered the question regarding um, consumer uh, collecting uh, collecting data because you do mm -hmm. not only you've done the study on packaging, yeah. but you also collect information from consumers and you also collect information from suppliers. Let me ask you, and I think we should also look into the questions we have here on uh, Q and A um, regarding traceability. Mm -hmm. How what type of evidence do you expect from your suppliers? How do you trace mm -hmm. that? All the, the all the ticks they put uh, yeah. packaging etc. Yeah. So how how do you yeah. trace that? Yeah, I would, yeah. To start with, I would say that uh, we have done quite much work on mapping our supply chains, and and we have quite many unique products in the in the fixed assortments. Uh, so I think we have two thousand more than two thousand eight hundred unique products in in our fixed assortment. Then we have the order assortment. So, so, but but uh, focusing on the fixed assortment, which represents the the most of the volumes, uh, we we realized, uh, I think it was four or five years ago, that we really really needed to map the supply chains in terms of the farmers and producers, where they are, who they are, because that's a that's the main. I mean, that's a that's a base to do the other things that we need to do. So we have a quite extensive IT platform that we use today to map all, all these supply chains. And what we do with that is that we do a risk analysis of the total assortment in terms of uh, combining, again, as I said before, uh, related to the sustainable choice in the shops. We have quite the same methodology when it comes to do the risk analysis of, of uh, the whole assortment. So we combine land risk data, if they have certifications, their, if how they answer SAQs that we are sending out to farmers and producers, so that in the end, we will have some residual risks related to some of the producers, some of the farmers in some of the origins, so that we can focus on those that we consider to have the highest risk. So that is one of the main reasons why we have mapped our supply chains, but we, we also use it for uh, I mean, for other purposes, like like uh, sustainable choice. But I would like to point out that, uh, I mean, the power of the consumers is really something that we should, uh, uh, I mean, to, 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 to take into to our processes to, to really try to save the planet. But it will not, the consumers and their expectations and, and their needs uh, will not save the planet, I, I, I don't think. It will not save the planet. It's it, it's not enough. So we really need to have as a as a company a high degree of integrity in terms that we really need to have our own agenda in addition to the the power of the consumers. So we need to do some things that is not asked by the consumers. Um, 
sometimes we might need to do something that they think is not the best thing to do <laughs> uh, because they have their perceptions of, of uh, plastics and different kind of packaging etc and what is kind of a good wine can it really be bottled on on etc is, is that, re that really possible so we I think we have a responsibility to push the limits in that sense. That's exactly, actually, that's the, the in the way the question of this whole uh, climate talk is, is, uh, is retailers taking the responsibility of influencing a supply chain and consumers alike, yes. And you're absolutely right in regards to that. Uh, let's look at the questions we have here because we, we have already six. Uh, Laiz Moro from Brazil is asking us, uh, here, sustainable wine in Brazil is not recognized. Hard to find, very costly since uh, mostly are imported. I'd like to know how is data collection? If you guys unite the data from the vineyard uh, for the calculation or its calculator after the wine left the winery, I think we can all answer that. And in, well, the, the calc that has to do with the calculations that uh, producers can do by measuring their life cycle analysis at the end of the day. And many of the questions that are being asked by by uh, these two retailers in front of us uh, should answer those questions. What would occur uh, if you stopped purchasing product, product from a producer that continues to he he use heavyweight glass bottles? Would that incre increase the velocity of change? Okay, there was just, I suppose, a qualification there is that um, we do, when we look at glass lightweighting, we do look at volume of wine as well. So it's not that we will have an edict to say everything must be below this weight. We do look at the portfolio and say, you know, if 95% of your products shift this much, you know, what have you got left with some of the products that might be super premium, etc. So there is a little bit of scope there because um, it's all about the overall direction of travel and where you've got high volume lines, that's really what you have to get after in terms of lightweight and glass. Um, and that's been um, our approach as well. And also in terms of what you can move in bulk, we are increasing the number by, I think next year, it's going to be over 3 million extra bottles are going to be transported by bulk. And there is a balance as well, because there is sometimes benefits with keeping um, products bottled in, um, in their regions. So on that one, I would but say- let me ask you something, sorry to interrupt you, because an important point regarding, uh, regarding importing in bulk is that there are many appellation systems that have, that do not comply with that type of shipping. That means, that literally means that if you have that as a rule, that many wine countries, many wine regions will be affected by that, that, that requirement from you. So that's why it's not a rule. It is the direction of travel. So what we look at is, and you're absolutely right, like I would say that probably a quarter of our product is shipped in bulk. And a lot of the reasons for the other is to do, as you say, with legislation, et cetera. But we would also task those suppliers as well and be in dialogue about how can you maximize if you are getting glass produced locally, how can that be improved as much as possible? How can we look at the transport to the UK as well? And how can that be improved? Because if we were to take a really hard line edict, you'd have a very small range of products. And we do want to have, you know, an interesting range, but maxed out to the best possible um, level as, you know, in terms of sustainability to, to leave no stone unturned in that. Yeah. Okay. So just to sort of to wrap it up, there was a question in, in chat that suddenly it was answered. Uh, it's, it's actually a topic that is really key that we didn't talk to. We talk about packaging. But as an organization speaking with wine producers from every part of the world on a daily basis, water it comes as a key challenge. And as we know, water is such a key issue. So let me ask you, I know this was in the questions, but is water something like water footprint? Because we always talk about carbon footprint, but we don't talk about water footprint. And one of the, 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 the okay, just to share something, the, the wines of New Zealand uh, measure everything they do as an industry. And for example, they measure that 98% uh, of the wine consumption comes from um, irrigation in, in, in vineyards. 
Is it something that you look at in your requirements, looking at water footprint and not just carbon footprint? So I can probably comment because- Sorry, I, I yes. Uh, in this case, it was one of the retailers. Sorry yeah, about just that. To, I mean, obviously on soft drinks and in other categories, that would be something that would be uh, quite sort of front and center. I actually, when we included that on in one of our questions in our questionnaire um, to our suppliers and sustainability. And not surprisingly, I suppose, the regions that are most pressed have been pretty innovative. And there we're able to cite lots of examples where through the use of gray water or review of their processes in the winery, they were able to reduce um, quite significantly the water usage. And um, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Marta, that I did a project on uh, sustainability and water usage in South Australia. And at the time I was, I was really impressed at the level of focus within Australia out of necessity, you know, um, so textbook figures of how much water you need per vine um, were being totally challenged and innovative methods were being employed. So I would say that this is an area where forward thinking um, vineyard owners are doing some really, really good um, activities in this area. So um, we heard back lots of stories on that. That was much easier than carbon measurement, actually, because the water usage, there's usually a meter that you can understand. So um, that's been uh, been looked at. So. OK, I will have a last question for you both uh, coming from chat. Actually, in the meantime, we have more. But Scott, let me ask you, you deal with many other industries and you deal, for example, with restaurants that are absolutely key for this industry as well. Is there any industry that you see taking the, the lead? I mean, we've seen leadership here for sure. No doubts about that. But do you see any examples from other industries that you feel are repli replicable in this universe we're talking about? Ooh, I love that question, Marta. And, and I think what I love about that question is I think there are conversations like this happening inside of every single industry at this point in time. And the, the quality of the conversation might differ, but the conversations have begun. And I think one key piece we haven't really touched on in this call is how much control retailers really have. So I don't have a sense of what percent of the wine industry does Marks and Spencer influence? If you say, this is the direction we're headed, how much of the industry has to listen to you? Um, and that's become kind of an interesting piece in other industries is some of the retailers are saying, this is the direction we wanna go, but we're not big enough. We're the world's largest retailer. We're still not big enough to really influence this industry. And so that's where collaboration becomes key. Carmel? Yeah, well, I suppose in terms of the size of MS, um, I mean, we're not we're not one of the top three in the UK, but we in terms of premium offering, we will be a go-to. So, and in terms of consumer trust in our brand, um, we we feature really, really high on the metrics, you know, in terms of uh, quality, perception, and trust. So we would we would, um, I mean, I saw some data recently and we will be the leading retailer in the UK with quite a distance between the uh, the one that will be next to us in that, uh, in that forum. So I would say um, there's, there, it, is, it is very important to, to engage with consumers and to, to really sort of stay close to, uh, to the, the mood on that. Let me ask you a final question. Now I'll start with you, Marcus. We've spoken about lightweight. We've spoken about other materials. Okay, we always end up in packaging. What about reusable schemes? That's one of the the, the other question we have in in our chat. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's kind of the big solution. But yeah. you have you have lots of challenges because you have to do you have to agree on on global standards in terms of. Of, of the packaging, I mean the size, uh, the, the the design of the product, and the weight and the material, etc. If you if you can have a global agreement and consensus around some different kind of packaging that could travel around the world, like we have containers today. I've been I've been involved in standardization, ISO standardization for 12 years, but but was the focus was sustainability, but 
Um, I think standardization is a solution to that. If we can agree, but that means that, I mean, producers who want to design the bottles uh, and things like that, they, they won't be able to do that on the bottle design and things like that. They, so, so, I mean, it will be, it's a real challenge in terms of marketing your products, but I think the solution is to, to have a global system. That might be the solution uh, because if, if you have these uh, land-based national uh, systems, they are not; they will not work if you are exporting products. It will just uh, a universal yeah. bottle, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I just want to comment on uh, take the opportunity to comment on on the water issue, but because I think there are many issues uh, in addition to climate that really needs to be addressed. So working on climate and putting lots of efforts on climate we should not forget biodiversity the soil health the long-term soil health the water and and uh, etc because uh, it's we it's really keen that we need to make a win-win situation and we've done some research on biodiversity vs climate trying to see where do we have benefits benefits for both and where do we have where do we have a competition in terms of practices? So I think that's very important to keep in mind to, to not uh, uh, sub-optimate, so to say. Uh, having said that, I think working with climate in overall, you will benefit, uh, you will have benefits for, for water, you will have benefits for biodiversity. So climate will still be one of the most important ones. I think in terms of consumers as well, um, the biodiversity stories are things people can really relate to. Yeah. So yeah. Um, while there's other aspects that we would address that might be um, a slightly less engaging story, um, you know, that, that was a really, really strong message that came back as well um, when we did our uh, detailed questionnaire with our suppliers. Mm -hmm. The sort of super fodder there that, you know, if we can, if we can get the messaging and the method right, that is very engaging. Actually, when we think of climate as an organization, Mark, let's just to wrap it up, we don't think uh, in any way just as climate. When we think of climate, actually, there's an expression that I, I also think comes from one of the Nordic countries, which is a carbon tunnel. That's the one we try not to have. So when we speak about climate, we speak about or climate impact. We speak about biodiversity. We speak about water. We speak about... Uh, Oh, now I forgot, but there's one thing that we should only not, not speak about is just uh, carbon. There, there's a, a myriad of topics, uh, especially coming from, uh, because we are farmers at the end of the day. Uh, and so there are a myriad of topics that are related to, to climate change and biodiversity. So, and soil, as you said, so it's all part of this, this crisis that we're living in. So all these, all these, um, aspects should be touched and that's why it's always we never we always end up uh, talking about packaging but there are other really important issues that we should take in place starting again with with water and well with water and soil at the end of the day would you guys like to have a final final message for our audience what do you think it's key that you can play uh, what key role i mean you talk about your role one thing that every retailer can do to drive climate action for example Scott. Wow. So I, th I think the, the one key thing from a retailer perspective is engage with your suppliers in deep, meaningful conversations about how you can collaborate together to achieve these uh, net zero goals. Okay. I I, I, yeah, I, I might um, jump in here. I would say is um, follow the science and to be brave. Um, and then, then the job is to take consumers with you. But I think if we're in a position of a power and authority, we have an obligation to do that. We have to do the right thing and we have to lead when we know what needs to be done. Marcus? Yep. Yeah, I would emphasize uh, collaboration uh, in terms of standardization, harmonization, because we have so great tools out there in terms of, uh, I mean, sustainability certifications and different kind of 
of our practices, but we need to speak the same language, so to yes. say. So we have some collaboration among the Swe uh, the northern monopolies. Yes, uh, yes. And we have uh, we are engaged on also in the sustainable wine roundtable, and those are two examples where we try to harmonize and standardize, because I I think that's a way to release the full potential of all the good practices and tools that we have. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I I think uh, and we've had very good comments. We could stay here for hours, but I won't take any more of your time. Thank you so much. I think we were able to touch many of the points. Uh, this was just one question of mine, but I'm not going to ask you anyway. Thank you very much for being here today. This call, let me tell this to Scott, Carmel and Marcus, will just drop off. We, there's no other way we found with Zoom to do this. We'll create just another call just to say goodbye properly to you. Thank you everyone that was on the other side of the audience with us. And I hope you found this conversation insightful. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.